Welcome to Sketchy. We take all the super complex stuff you need to learn and turn them into memorable visual stories packed full of everything you need to know on test day. Click the link in the corner or description to try for free for seven days. Now let's get to it. Welcome back. Last time we talked about the most common disease of the pericardium, acute pericarditis. In this sketch, we'll continue on where we left off in part one by covering the other pericardial diseases you'll need to know pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade, and constrictive pericarditis. If you've completed our sketchy path course, you know what's coming. We're heading back to the concert venue. Only we're not dealing with jangly country guitar music this time. Nope, it's time to bleed metal. At Sketchy, you're no plebe. We're giving you an all-access pass. So let's head backstage and kick off our first disease, pericardial effusion. As you might have heard from our last sketch, the pericardial space normally contains a small amount of fluid. A pericardial effusion, then, is just too much of a good thing. When there's more fluid than normal in the pericardial space, we call it a pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion can develop in patients with virtually any condition that affects the pericardium, but it doesn't have to occur with any pericardial disease. Just like this happy backstage fan, if your patient has a pericardial effusion, they probably don't know it. The normal pericardium can stretch to accommodate additional fluid, uh, to a point. How much fluid the pericardium can tolerate is largely dependent on how quickly the effusion develops. Subacute or chronic effusions allow the pericardium time to stretch to accommodate all that extra fluid, so patients usually won't see symptoms until a big effusion develops. With acute pericardial effusions, however, you don't have luxury of time, which means symptoms will manifest despite a much smaller volume of fluid. Hence the Speed Kills t-shirt. So metal. 